the day of uh, meetings between uh, you who come from uh, Beijing, from McGovern uh, Institute and Peking University, and us who come from the Hebrew University and uh, organized a meeting with the new brain center in Jerusalem called ELSEC. It's on the name of Edmond and Lily Safra, who uh, gave most of the funds necessary to bootstrap this process. So today we will talk about molecular and cellular level studies of uh, brain research. And we have three speakers who are the invited guests from uh, China. And now I hope I pronounce the names of the speaker right. And I welcome all of you, the speakers and the students, I guess, who came here. Uh, Yuji Naya, did I say your name correctly? Uh, Shimui Han. <laughs> and uh, CJ, by now I know. <laughs> Chen Chian Li. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming here and for telling us about the science that you do. And I would like to thank also the speakers from ELSEC, uh, Professor Chagai Bergman, who will be here later, Baruch Menke, who is sitting here, Eran Meshurer, who should come in a few minutes, uh, Amit Sitri, and uh, that's it. We are four speakers. Uh, the fifth speaker on the schedule could not make... Ah, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, from the beginning, Chagai Bergman, Baruch Minke, Ran Meshorer, Alex Vinstock, and Amit Sitri. And the last speaker could not make it due to a family uh, event uh, problem. And we will start without any further ado. I just want to uh, say one thing. I'm really, really sorry about some difficulties that uh, this trip uh, encountered. One major difficulty had to do with the Israeli uh, Foreign Affairs uh, Office, who went on, whose employees went on strike. I have to say personally, I think it's a justified strike, but it's not justified what happened to our science and also to many other scientific events, business events, students, and most devastating people who cannot leave other countries where they are with children and with diseases, with all kinds of problems. So it's a general problem. I just wanted to emphasize, please understand that this was a general problem. And I know that this visa issue really was devastating for, the, for you, the people who came from Beijing. So I welcome you, everyone. I hope uh, to be able to show you a little bit about what brain science is about here in a wider scale maybe during the day, and uh, we will uh, start the session, and I would like to invite you, CJ, to open the first session. Uh, we are trying to build a very international, high-caliber uh, science program, uh, including neuroscience. Uh, McGovern Brain Institute was inaugurated last year, and I went back to Peking University after 25 years in the United States. Uh, another great thing to tell you is, Baruch Minky and I, uh, he was a postdoc and I was a graduate student in Bill Pack's lab. So we are lab mates in that sense. <laughs> lab reunion. Uh, so Yuji uh, is going to tell us about his research and the title is Signal Flow, Sustaining Semantic and Episodic-like Memory in the Primate uh, Model. Uh, today's title is uh, Signal Flows uh, that Substantiate uh, the Semantic and Episodic-like Memory in the Primate uh, Middle Temporal Lobe. Uh, there are several types of the long-term memory, and semantic memory and episodic memory. Uh, they are the subcategories of the decorative memory. Decorative memory uh, is substantiated by uh, the middle temporal lobe in our brain. I'll uh, give you the example of the semantic memory. What do you remember from this picture? And Italy, yes. Uh, the semantic memory, uh, we can ask this test uh, using the two alternative uh, false choice. In this case, uh, this is correct, as you said, yeah? and this is error. 
And by the way, uh, can you remember uh, when you study this association? When did you study this association? Do you remember? No? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I, I expect it. <laughs> if you remember, uh, this is an episodic memory. Yeah? Uh, if you can remember when you uh, run this association, it's an episodic memory. But most of us, we can't remember this when we uh, associate, we learn, we learn these associations. So uh, the semantic memory is a general knowledge of the facts. So, and uh, the degradative memory. Now, uh, I will ask, what is a degradative memory? Uh, degradative memory consists of the episodic memory and semantic memory. And the definition is uh, we can remember what we, uh, we can describe what we remember. So uh, if uh, we give the acute recall paradigm, uh, the information goes, uh, this is the Q information, and there are some associations. And if uh, the information, uh, retrieved information, goes back and as a, uh, it is represented as a sensory or degradative memory, uh, degradative information, it's a degradative memory. So uh, in this case, we can use this information very flexible manner, yeah? because we can uh, get the information, uh, we can get the retrieved information. If it doesn't go to the, uh, it doesn't go, uh, and uh, the memory is expressed by the response, it's categorized as non decorative memory. And these procedures are processed by uh, for the association, the core brain area is a middle temporal lobe. And uh, the information, Q information, uh, is given by the, uh, the neocortex. And retrieved information goes back to the neocortex. So, uh, in. <laughs> okay, thank you. So when we think about uh, the decorative memory, these uh, bidirectional signaling uh, between the middle temporal lobe and neocortex, this is very important. So uh, now I'll talk about the signal flows uh, for the uh, semantic-like memory, particularly uh, the item-item association memory. I use monkey. We use the monkeys uh, to examine the signal flow. Uh, so uh, monkey can't uh, monkey can't use the uh, monkey can't use the language. So we use the visual items. Uh, before we train the monkeys, uh, we uh, be, uh, we uh, paired these items. For example, if uh, this picture is presented, monkey is required to retrieve this uh, picture. And opposite way, uh, if this picture is presented, monkey is required to retrieve this uh, picture. So we used uh, these 24 pictures, 12 pa uh, pairs of the pictures we used. In a behavioral task, first, monkey is required to fixate uh, this uh, white dot. And after the one second, uh, Q stimulus is presented. And uh, two seconds, after this delay period, uh, two stimuli are presented. One is a paired associate of the, uh, this Q picture, in this case this. And the other is a distractor from other pairs. So if monkey uh, touch, choose, uh, this stimulus, uh, monkey can get the fruit juice as a reward. So, uh, in our uh, paradigm, the main target is a perilinear cortex. And what is perilinear cortex? Perilinear cortex is a member uh, of the middle temporal low memory system. Middle temporal low consists of the hippocampus, entorhinal cortex, perilinear cortex, and parahippocampal cortex. And at the location, these are the brains of the human, monkey, and rat. Perilinear cortex is here. Uh, this is our uh, main target area. In addition to the perilinear cortex, uh, we also examine the uh, visual area TE. Actually, uh, perilinear cortex uh, has two subdivisions. Uh, One is uh, area 36, and the other is area 35. 
uh, we examined the area 36 because uh, this visual area TE uh, and area 36, they are just mixed. So area 36 is just uh, superior to the area TE. And area TE is uh, the last stage of the ventral visual pathway that processes the object information. So object information is provided from the area TE to the area 36 of the perianal cortex. And uh, they, are, uh, they have the very dense bidirectional uh, projections. So uh, we examined the area 36 and TE, and we compared their neuronal properties during the uh, visual pair association task. This is an example of the neurons of uh, area 36 in the perilinear cortex. Uh, X axis indicates the time, and this gray bar indicates the, the Q presentations. And uh, this is a one trial, this is a last plot. The black dot indicates uh, the spike firing. And uh, in this case, this neuron shows very strong response uh, when uh, this uh, four prime, four prime stimulus uh, was presented as a Q. And also, when uh, the pair of this stimulus, in this case, the stimulus four, was presented. This neuron also uh, shows a very strong response as this. But when other stimuli are presented, this neuron don't, that, uh, didn't show the strong response at all. I show you the stimulus selectivity of this neuron. Uh, X axis shows uh, the stimulus pair. Uh, so uh, this neuron shows a very strong response only uh, when the stimuli of the pair four was presented. So we refer to this type of the neurons as pair coding neurons, originally reported by the uh, Sakai and Miyashita. Okay. So now we compare the uh, pair coding effect between uh, area 36 and area TE. We are recorded from area 36 and TE uh, 510 neurons and this number of the neurons. And first, we examined if they show the stimulus selective activities during the Q period or not, using the one way ANOVA. And this uh, number of the neurons, 76 neurons, show the stimulus selective responses in area 36 and 347 neurons in area TE. So these uh, two uh, graphs show the population responses. Uh, top panel shows the responses when optimal stimulus was presented. So uh, in this case, we uh, normalize these activities uh, using the average response during the Q period. So the amplitude is the same. But please uh, look at here. Uh, LTE uh, starts to respond earlier than uh, area 36. This shows uh, visual area uh, starts to fire first and just 10 milliseconds, or in this case, uh, 7 milliseconds or 8 milliseconds later, area 36 to start to show. This uh, indicates uh, area TE uh, give, provides uh, visual information to the area 36. And important uh, is uh, here, uh, this is a response when the pair of the optimal stimulus is uh, presented. So uh, if we see, uh, area 36 show uh, stronger responses as this than uh, area TE. So uh, this, uh, result, this, this result indicate uh, area 36 show the more stronger, uh, stronger pair coding effect than area TE. We quantified this pair coding effect uh, using the correlation co uh, coefficient. So uh, green bar indicates the, uh, the number of the neurons in area 36 uh, to each uh, correlation coefficient value. And red bar indicates the TE. So uh, both areas, they show the positive correlation coefficient. So uh, they have significant effect of the uh, pair coding. But pair coding effect of the area 36 is much stronger than area T. 
So if you define uh, the neurons, pair coding neurons, that shows the significant effect of the pair coding. Uh, this is the percentage. Area statistics shows a higher percentage of the pair coding neurons than area TE. So now I'll show you the spatial distributions of the pair coding neurons. Uh, this is uh, uh, coronal sections of the monkey brain. Uh, this is the anterior middle temporal sulcus. This is a rhinal sulcus. Uh, this square is magnified as this. And actually, we uh, injected the uh, first blue, the tracers. And uh, this uh, blue crosses uh, shows the just recorded neurons, the site of the recorded neurons. And open uh, yellow circle indicates the stimulus selective neurons. And uh, this field yellow indicates the pair coding neurons. So uh, you can see the stimulus selective neurons, including the pair coding neurons, they distributed very in small size. I'll show you the uh, unfolded map. I unfold it uh, as this, like that. I unfold it. And uh, I'll show the direction. This is the anterior, this is the posterior, and this is the lateral, and this is the medial. Uh, this pink line indicates the sulcus of the anterior middle temporal sulcus. And this uh, ivory line indicates uh, the borders between the area statistics and uh, area TE. So if we see, first we uh, can find the stimulus selective neurons including the area set, uh, including the pair coding neurons, they distributed in very small areas, small spot. We deferred uh, to this area as hot spot. And in TE, they distributed more scattered. And there are many pair coding neurons, and pair coding neurons in area TE not necessarily distributed the close to the area 36. And we didn't find uh, the areas that uh, contains uh, the many pair coding neurons as much as uh, area 36. So this spatial distribution indicates the pair coding effect in area TE uh, is getting very uh, jump or uh, increase very dramatically uh, from the step uh, between the T from the TE to area 36. It should be the one uh, synaptic connection. So actually, uh, pair coding neurons uh, is repo was reported by the Sakai and Miyashita. But I think most of the, uh, the neurons they reported it uh, from area TE. So uh, this uh, study, we showed the, uh, the pair, uh, distributions of the pair coding neurons in area 36. And we compared. And we uh, suggest the signal flow that substantiates the pair coding effect. So now, uh, this is a very uh, simple, very schematic one. But uh, from area T to area 36, representation of each object goes to the maybe unitized uh, period. And I actually, I uh, insisted, oh, uh, from area T to area 36, the pairing occurs. But Maybe and this is unitized. A and B is uh, completely huge or no. The representation is completely huge or no. And uh, some groups, they uh, suggested uh, the unitization occurs in the perilinear cortex, uh, particularly from the group, uh, this group and this group. Uh, they uh, suggested uh, the unitization in the perilinear cortex uh, using the recognition paradigm. And this group, uh, they suggested the uh, percep uh, visual per functional uh, role of the visual perceptions in the perilinear cortex. And they also suggested uh, the unitization in the perilinear cortex. But the single type of neural representation in one area a perilinear cortex is a unitization of AB. 
This is very, I think this is very oversimplification. Actually, when we look for the neural representations of individual neurons, there are many neurons. Uh, this is a study uh, we recorded from area 35. Area 35 is another sub-area of the perianal cortex. And this is very small area. We try to record from this small area. And we found the direct selective neurons in area 35 showed the uh, unitizations as this, optimal and pair. When the responses uh, in the, for the optimal and pair, they showed very uh, similar responses, completely similar, same responses as this. So uh, we found direct selective neurons in area 35, they showed the unitizations. But, oh, but direct selective neurons are not whole populations. Actually, there are more uh, Q selective neurons. They don't show the direct selective activities. So, if we show the uh, population responses uh, during the Q period, the responses uh, of the optimal is different from the pair. So only the delay selective neurons in area 35 can provide that unitization effect. So now, uh, by the way, uh, what, how, uh, what is the delay activity in area 36? What they represent? This is an example of the uh, delay selective neurons in area 36. In this case, they showed, during the delay activity, they showed the, uh, they keep the information during the Q presentations as this. And optimal and pair, they are different. And they uh, continue to uh, show the, uh, the present, uh, representation of the Q period. And we also found another type of the neurons. In these neurons, this is the Q period. This neuron showed very strong response uh, for particular uh, pair, uh, for particular stimulus as this. But uh, these neurons stopped their firing during the delay period. But when the pair of this optimal stimulus is presented, this neuron shows a very, uh, shows a sustained activity as this. So this indicate these neurons uh, represent not the Q stimulus itself, but uh, the target stimulus. It will be presented, it will be appeared, and they have to choose after the delay. It is a paired associate of this Q stimulus. So uh, this neuron shows the activities. It is related with the uh, retrieval process. So we referred uh, to this neuron as a uh, pair recall neurons, as this. During the Q period, uh, this, is very, uh, this, is more, uh, this is strongest. But during the delay period, the pair of this optimal species is presented. This neuron, the strongest activity during the delay period. So, uh, this uh, pair recall neuron is reported uh, by Sakai and Miyashita, but this is in LTE. But we show the pair recall uh, neurons uh, also exist in the area 36. And uh, now we show, uh, we compare the pair recall activities and Q holding activities in area 36 and in area TE. In case of the area 36, uh, effect of the pair recall is similar with the effect of the Q holding. So the pair recall neurons and Q holding neurons, the uh, strengths of the effect for the pair recall and Q hold, they are very similar. So if we uh, watch from the outside and we just uh, 
calculate the average, we can't distinguish. But each neuron shows one is a pair equal one, one is Q holding, like that. In area 35, single neurons doesn't distinguish pair recall and Q holding, like that. Are you okay? But in area TE, most of the TE neurons show the pair recall, not Q holding. There's a uh, strong differentiation. Area 36 has both information, but area TE uh, represent only the information a monkey has to use after the delay. So if we watch uh, the representation of the single neurons, if uh, Q stimulus is presented, area TE first shows uh, this, uh, represents this image. And after that, there are some uh, transformations, transfer from the Q holding to the pair equal. Uh, this transfer is uh, reported by the Hirabayashi et al. Uh, 2000, uh, sorry, 2013. <laughs> 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 and uh, we also uh, reported uh, there are some uh, backward spreading uh, from the perilinear cortex to the area TE. So uh, visual stimulus can go to perilinear cortex and there are some associations and uh, this retrieved information spread backward uh, from the neocortical areas, in this case, area TE. And also, small population, but perilinea cortex can also uh, represent the unitized information. It is like a concept, in this case, maybe like a New York or something like that. This is uh, uh, the picture and the signal flows in case of the item-item association. Next, I move to the uh, inter-domain associations. There are some, uh, several reports about the inter-domain associations, but uh, we focused on the integrations between item and time. What, first, uh, what is time? Could you answer? Can you answer? What is time for you? What is time? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, this is very difficult question, but uh, easy question is, uh, what time is it now? And how long did you sleep last night? We can easily answer. So uh, we have uh, time has two properties. One is uh, just as a time point, and the other is a continuous time passes. If we measure uh, this duration we can define the time period. So time has two properties. Uh, this is a physical time, but for the memory time, this is a time passes and we have some events and we uh, encode uh, these events as a sequence of the events. This is a temporal order. And we will uh, get, we, will, we can encode the episodic memory. So uh, temporal order, is uh, uh, the big uh, main, uh, the important component of the episodic memory. So we try to uh, elucidate how media temporal lobe can encode uh, the integration of the item and time. We use uh, this uh, temporal order task. In this task, uh, we present two items sequentially, and there's a uh, delay between these two items. After the encoding uh, phase, we represent, we presented uh, three stimuli. Two items are the uh, stimuli we presented during the encoding phase, and the other is uh, uh, the destructor. So monkey uh, chose uh, this first and this next. They can get reward. So in this task, monkey can encode uh, the what is presented, uh, these two items, and their temporal orders. We use uh, these eight stimuli through the old recording sessions and training. So these uh, stimuli are very familiar, but the sequence are updated uh, trial by trial. 
uh, in this case, in this paradigm, uh, we recorded uh, from TE perinatal cortex and also entrinal cortex and hippocampus. So we recorded from the four areas. Uh, we first, we examined uh, the responses during the Q period. We compared uh, the neurons uh, showed uh, stronger responses during Q1, uh, first Q period, or the second Q period. And if they showed the differential responses uh, between the two Q periods, uh, we refer to the neurons as time cells. And we also examined the stimulus activities uh, during uh, Q1 and also during Q2. If they show the stimulus selectivity uh, during Q1 or Q2, we refer to the neurons as item cells. So the number of the neurons uh, for the item cells, T has many item cells and decreasing proportions are this. More than, uh, we just uh, examined the stimulus selectivity using one way and over. We didn't uh, test for each item. If they respond differentially, it's at item cells. Uh, but uh, the time cells uh, is a top in the hippocampus and as this. Hmm? Uh, so this is uh, uh, our, this is uh, just definitions. If they show the differential responses between Q1 and Q2, we just refer to the time cells. Uh, but uh, why we uh, named as this? I'll show you the next uh, result. Uh, this, uh, these are the examples of the hippocampus uh, time cells. Uh, this is a Q1 period and this is a Q2 period. This neuron, uh, this neuron didn't show the responses during the Q1 period, but uh, started to uh, increase its activities as this. And we also found uh, other types of the neurons, decreasing type. This neuron showed uh, uh, some activities uh, during the Q1 period, but uh, decrease uh, their acti these activities as uh, this gradually. So one cell uh, shows a gradual increase uh, between the, these uh, two Q periods during the delay. And the other neurons show the decreasing activities. We summarize this effect using the population vector analysis uh, because if we just do an uh, average for entire population of the hippocampus cells because uh, they have the increasing type and decreasing time, we don't, we don't, we can't uh, characterize it because just zero, it will be canceled out. So uh, we uh, define the, their states using a population vector uh, and uh, we uh, tracked from the Q1 state how they are going, how is their track to the Q2 state? We uh, measure the distance uh, from each time point to the, from the Q1 state and to the Q2 state. Uh, this graph shows uh, x-axis. This is a delay period. This is a delay period. Q1 is presented here and Q2 is presented here. So this is a, a delay period. And this, uh, each, this uh, field circle shows uh, the distance, normal distance uh, at this time point from the Q1 state. So uh, the distance from the Q1 state increased very gradually. In contrast, uh, the distance uh, to the Q2 state, it uh, decreased gradually. So uh, as the population, hippocampus can provide the time passes uh, from the last event, from the previous event, and the estimate uh, time to the next event. So this type of the incremental timing signals uh, was observed uh, in two animals we used. But uh, 
other areas, entrainal cortex and perianal cortex, they didn't show uh, such kind of the incremental timing signal. So this uh, type of the, the time cells, not only from us, uh, the some rodent people, rodent groups, they are also reported the time cells in the hippocampus. Uh, one is a group of the Buzaki, and uh, the other is Eichenbaum. The both of them, they show the gradual change, gradual change of the states of the hippocampus cells from uh, one event to the next event. Are you okay for the, about the time cells? No, uh, I, I understand what you mean. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, this is, uh, I think this uh, kind, this time signal is a product of, of the learning, some learning. Yes. So, uh, monkey uh, repeatedly uh, do the, the, the same type or the same parameter of the task. And, uh, and finally, I think when we uh, record, uh, we found that the states uh, gradually uh, change uh, during the delay period. In at that during that time, no physical change, no physical st the stimulus uh, doesn't change at all, just the fixation point. The next, I'll show you the, the time effect uh, of the item cells. Uh, these are the example of the item cells in the perianal cortex. Uh, this is one cell, this is uh, another cell. Uh, this neuron, uh, this is uh, the Q period, both Q1 and Q2, and we overlaid uh, the responses for the Q1 and Q2. This neuron shows a very strong response to the stimulus segment when it was presented as Q1. Uh, there. But this, okay. <laughs> uh, but this neuron didn't show so strong response as there. And we found another type of the neuron. Uh, this neuron shows the stronger responses to the stimulus three uh, for the Q2 than Q1, as this. So, and this differential responses was observed only when uh, neurons responded uh, to the stimulus, as this. This is a Q presentation. So this time we have to only ap appear only when the stimulus is presented, when the event happens. This is very different from the hippocampus. And uh, this effect is dominant, uh, most uh, evident uh, compared with the TE. In the, uh, this uh, time effect is very, uh, more robust in the perianal cortex compared to the TE, area TE. So from these results, we uh, suggest, we hypothesize, uh, in contrast to the item-item associations, it's occurred in the bidirectional signaling between LTE and the perianal cortex. But including the hippocampus, uh, item information uh, comes from the LTE and the incremental timing signal from the hippocampus, and they are integrated in the perianal cortex. So this is a different types of the signal flows in different uh, tasks. So I will acknowledge uh, the temporal order, uh, the study of the temporal order, I acknowledge the Wendy Suzuki at, Tokyo New, uh, at New York University. And for the item-item associations, uh, he's my uh, previous advisor, uh, Yasushi Miyashita. And at the Peking University, uh, I started uh, from last September's and we will uh, do, we will expand uh, my studies. One is uh, multi-sensory associations. We use the item-item associations for the visual modality, but uh, we will try the associations between the auditory stimulus and the visual stimulus. And also, we will uh, try to elucidate the interactions between the, the semantic memory and the episodic memory. I'm looking, I would be happy if I can show you these results for the next time. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.
code in, in TE and in um, 36, I guess. Um, and you said that in 36 you have the neurons which uh, unite the two uh, uh, stimuli, the, uh, the pairs, the two pairs, and don't differentiate. While in TE, some neurons respond to both, but differently. I was wondering if the timing is different. You, you showed us that uh, TE responds first and uh, uh, 36 uh, uh, later. Okay, right. yeah. Okay. What about I, di I didn't show uh, this talk, but uh, for the perceptual information, TE is first, and the perilinear cortex, area 36 is the next. But for the pair record signal, area 36 is first, and TE is the next. So that is why uh, we uh, suggested, we hypothesized, the pair record signal spreads backwards from area 36 to TE, uh, because they have very dense uh, projections. Yeah, if, so I understand that uh, what you're saying is that the original, just the information flows from TE to area 36, the, the thing, and that's based entirely on the uh, time differential. Yes. Is there any other evidence? I mean, is it possible that the two getting information? No, now this time, that, now this, this, this time we don't have. Uh, another information is uh, from the uh, anatomy. There's a very dense uh, projection from area T to the uh, area 36. And uh, area T shows the uh, visual response first and area 36 next. So that's uh, why we uh, suggest. So uh, I think uh, it will be the next uh, experiment. Maybe we have to, if we inactivate area T, what happens? Yeah. And also, maybe we are uh, recorded simultaneously. Is there any causality or no? It's a, yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. And uh, actually, uh, it's difficult to say, and I uh, tried such experimental paradigm, but this was very difficult, and I split uh, the left and right hemispheres, and I presented uh, the stimulus uh, just uh, one hemisphere, and I inject a mushmo, and I only uh, get the information that, uh, for the reaction time. I didn't find uh, the performance drops, no. Uh, I only get the uh, uh, the difference of the differential res uh, response uh, time. I think in this case, uh, we train the monkeys for one year, two year, and I think there's, there's many some uh, compensation effect if we uh, inactivate. Yeah, patients with uh, temporal lobe epilepsy often have degeneration in these parts of the, of the cortex. In, in perirhinal cortex or in uh, hippocampus. And uh, is there any evidence from the literature about their performance on these kinds of tests? Uh, so actually, uh, in case of the semantic dementia, I think they cannot, they cannot. And uh, in case of the, uh, the amnesia patients, uh, hippocampus, uh, I think it is difficult for them uh, to solve this kind of task uh, when first learned. But I think uh, some uh, report, if they learn very repeatedly, the performance is uh, increased very gradually. But sometimes their uh, knowledge is quite different from the declarative memory. It's like a perceptual memory. So just to solve the task, some other areas can compensate. So it's difficult to say. <laughs> About the time set. Yeah. You don't estimate the time, you need a clock. I mean, some neuron that fires regularly or something. How, how this is mechanic mechanistically achieved? Uh, so I think it's uh, important and I want to solve it, but I think that my idea, just my idea, hippocampus cells can uh, change their state very gradually. And if something happens, uh, but if they uh, repeatedly do the same type of the task, there are some uh, learning effect. And 
if one event happens, the, uh, their states are reset. And after that, they start to change their, uh, the states. And now I, we just uh, thought, oh, it's like a uh, uh, time clock in the memory. So there is some material that you huh? is hmm? How it's done mechanistically? There is accumulation of some substance, or what is accumulating? I mean, to get the timing. I mean, you need something you said to accumulate. I, w I want to add yeah. to the question, maybe you will use this, because looking at the raster's plot, I feel that there is some uh, timing mechanism, like some kind of oscillatory mechanism, because the firing of these neurons looked quite regular. Yeah. So if you have something like, uh, I don't know what, gamma, something like uh, some rhythm, you could use it to count time. Yeah. An interesting experiment would be to associate the local field potential recording from the same electrodes. Did you do this? Yeah, what I recall. What happens if the second event is missing? Mm -hmm. Then you could think about the monkey cannot expect that the second event will be missing mm -hmm. if it's just in a few tries. What yeah. happened on this? Yeah, it's a good question. And actually now, uh, we uh, designed this uh, different type of the task. And in such task, we will change the delay period. And what really happens, in, in our case, we use only the one second. And one second or five seconds, the each cell, how they change their uh, the response properties for the timing. And what happens? Uh, so it, it becomes like longer? Beca I don't think so. Uh, it becomes, uh, one is becomes like longer, and uh, the rodent group, they showed a different type of the time cells. In their case, they use uh, 10 seconds, and uh, the time cells shows uh, the they showed it shows that the uh, time receptive field, just for the one second after the uh, one event, and the another cell shows the next uh, one second like that, and they can bridge. So I want to watch. But you also show the population after all, right? Yeah. This, so these uh, lines are population. So as the population, they change and they are just they are getting the further and further. Uh, but how uh, individual cells behave? It's a different question. Uh, may I well, add? Just one comment to what you said, That's which important. is that in, in, uh, there are studies in, in interim cortex which show uh, intrinsic properties which keep the cell firing in, in an upstate once they go up uh, through persistent sodium currents and other. Uh, and other I activities, so there's I a natural tendency. And this I is I something think that in wake monkeys, I don't think it will happen because no, even not. without, yeah, I think no, you also. have delayed period activity. You have these reverberations happening, and the uh, question is the mechanism. Hmm. Well, well, the reverberation. Yeah. What kind of mutual synapse? How do you create reverberation? By having mutual synapses. Mm -hmm. That's very simple. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very simple. <laughs> and, and, uh, and it's not a question it's of measuring time. It's a, measure, it's a matter of order. So once the first cue appears, then the brain knows that that has happened, and now it recruits the, the next set of neurons to be ready to I get this. So you don't need, need a dedicated clock. You don't need a clock at all. I see. Okay. Yeah. I'll just start by saying that uh, I was. Um, the, the title I was, I was suggesting to, to discuss today is, is Plasticity of Chromatin uh, Following uh, Depolarization in Cultured Neurons. Um, and, and it's a very focused study of a graduate student who just uh, recently left the lab and we're currently, this, this study is under revisions. But uh, I thought that maybe, I w because I then realized that uh, instead of the promised 20 minutes, we got 40 minutes or 30, 35 minutes. Uh, I thought I would actually have a few more minutes in the end to tell you about uh, another exciting story which is even less related, uh, but it ends up with the whole brain. So I think it would be, uh, might be interesting. Uh, and it's actually reconstructing the epigenome of ancient uh, humans, of the Neanderthal. Uh, we found uh, an elegant way to do it. And basically, w what we end up with is, is we find that when we look at the differentially methylated regions between us and the Neanderthals, we end up with the, the, the brain being the most significant uh, uh, changed part. So we'll see if, we, if, we'll, if we'll get there, if we don't have any uh, bumps on the way. Um, 
Okay, so I'll start by, by discussing this first topic. Uh, this work was done primarily by a uh, graduate student in the lab, uh, Sailaja, uh, in collaboration with the lab in Japan, actually, uh, Takumi Tokizawa in Gunma University. Um, so I just have to, to go back and give you a little bit of a textbook uh, introduction and remind you that uh, uh, in every cell, in every neuron, basically, uh, the DNA is, is uh, structured in the form of chromatin. And chromatin is basically the DNA together with the histone proteins uh, forming this uh, nucleosome structure. So you have uh, core histones, uh, the ones that make the, the octamer, and then the linker histones. The linker histones are binding the linker region of the naked DNA between two adjacent nucleosomes. And there are additional uh, proteins that play a role in this uh, structure. Uh, like heterochromatin proteins uh, and other uh, features and enzymes that I'm not going to get into. The interesting thing is that we know a lot about the primary structure of chromatin and we know that chromatin is, is folded in a, into higher structure, uh, into higher order structures, but we know essentially zero about this higher order organization of chromatin within the cell. Um, what we do know, again, if we zoom in on this nucleosome, is that the tails of the histones protrude, and these are chemically modified. Uh, these are just uh, the lysines that can be modified by, by acetylation or methylation, arginines and lysines. And, and this actually opens or closes chromatin uh, for business. So if a gene uh, is expressed or needs to be expressed, uh, there are enzymes that can, can modify the methylation of, of lysine I to acetylation of, um, of lysine I and enable this um, uh, activity. Um, so these are the modifications and one of the fundamental properties of, of nuclear proteins in general is that the proteins that recognize these modifications are highly dynamic. And uh, so you can see this dynamic dance. And the way we can uh, study the dynamic association of, of proteins with chromatin in living cells is by generating GFP fusion proteins. So normally we take a chromatin protein and we fuse it with, with GFP or any other fluorescent protein that we like. And then we can transfect cells. Uh, we can create a, uh, stable neuronal cell lines or uh, even uh, mice that harbor some uh, GFP uh, encoding uh, protein uh, and then derive uh, the neurons from these mice and work on the neurons in culture. Um, and, and again, just a, a reminder of how we, how we study this. It's a photo bleaching assays or this particular assay that I'm going to discuss today is called FRAP or fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching. So uh, let's say we have a, a protein that is very dynamic in the cell nucleus. Of course, using light, uh, light imaging, we cannot see this, uh, these dynamics because we don't have the, the resolution to look at single molecules. Um, so what we do is actually we turn off some of these uh, uh, fluorescent molecules. We bleach a region with a powerful laser. So if this protein is highly dynamic, we'll get a rapid exchange between the un unbleached molecules and the bleached molecules, and we'll re revert back to the initial, um, initial situation. So we can actually generate these FRAP curves uh, and, and learn about the, the bleach depth, immobile fraction, and mobile fraction. So even if this protein, only 80% of it is mobile and 20% is immobile, we will be able to derive this from these graphs because we, will, we, will, we can infer the immobile fraction of this protein. Um, and uh, if we do this on chromatin proteins, we can actually get a grasp of chromatin dynamics, which for us gives us a feeling of chromatin plasticity. And I will explain why this is important uh, in neuronal activity. Uh, so here is an experiment of, of uh, th this is a single uh, nucleus. Uh, what you see here is a pseudo color of a chromatin protein. This time it's the linker histone H1, which I will uh, talk about uh, in the next 
a few slides, and here you can see the subcellular localization of this protein. These fossa are actually condensed chromatin. These are regions that uh, uh, are, are normally inactive, and you can see, or we call it heterochromatin. So we actually bleach this focus right here, and then we measure the recovery. So you can see that within a minute, uh, the protein recovers, and then again we get these uh, FRAP curves, and here's, here's what it looks like in, in real life. Uh, so this is the nucleus that you just saw, and this is the region that we're going to bleach, um, and you can see the recovery. So we basically just take time-lapse images uh, and then measure the dynamics of proteins in living cells. Um, <coughs> Actually, one of the surprises a few years ago when, when people started to analyze chromatin proteins and the dynamics of chromatin proteins in living cells, it was we always viewed, especially heterochromatin, this condensed chromatin, as a very stable complex. And we used to be taught biochemically that there are protein complexes that, that maintain a, a constant structures in the cell, but in fact, these proteins are very mobile, as you just saw from, from the, the movie that I just showed you, showed you. Within a minute or half a minute, you get almost a full replacement of these proteins, which means that even biochemical complexes can be highly dynamic. And even the most stable structures in the nucleus, such as heterochromatin, it's a structure that will never change, uh, is maintained by dynamic binding of proteins, which actually enables a lot of cellular and molecular interactions. So instead of just attaching a protein to, to the structure, you get touch and go, touch and go, and uh, basically allowing uh, other processes to take place. Well, in the time frame of the experiments, it's definitely true. Even, even late, so even if it would have taken us hours, it would still be in, in good approximation stable. Yes. Um, so the the two open questions in this uh, particular study is: first of all, we wanted to characterize the link between neuronal excitation and chromatin protein dynamics. What we showed in in previous works is that. During neuronal differentiation uh, of stem cells, we have restriction of chromatin plasticity, plasticity and chromatin protein dynamics. And we wanted to know also in, in mature neurons or, or in, in mature neural stem cells, maturing neural stem cells, whether we have this uh, uh, connection or, or relationship between chromatin or chromatin plasticity and neuronal excitation. And then, if so, what are the underlying mechanisms? So this is the model system. We take uh, E14.5 embryos. Uh, this is the, basically the telencephalon, uh, the developing cortex. Uh, and then we can culture these primary neurons either as uh, neural stem cells with uh, specific supplements, FGF, or as post-mitotic neurons, which takes about, within about a week, uh, we can uh, induce them to differentiate into non-dividing cells. We actually add the substance RSC, which ensures that we're left only with non-dividing cells because it kills all uh, cell division. Um, so, of course, th all these has been uh, widely studied in the literature for the past uh, 30 years or so, uh, and these are well-developed and, and well-characterized uh, methods. So again, this is just how it looks like. These are the neural stem cells. These are the proliferating neural stem cells, day three and day five. And, and here you can see the maturation of post-mitotic neurons within, uh, for, from day seven or so, you can already see this uh, very significant uh, uh, networks um, of neuronal processes. Uh, we also characterize them to, to uh, ensure that they express the correct markers, uh, like nesting in the neural stem cells and the uh, microtubule-associated protein MAP2 and post neurons, and there's TAJ1 uh, on the way, and, and uh, et cetera, et cetera. We also wanted to ensure that they respond to, uh, um, <coughs> to, respond to, to uh, uh, 
uh, KCL or glutamate, and this we can do by uh, calcium imaging. So using our uh, um, confocal spinning disc microscope, we basically can uh, do this live imaging with FURA. This is FURA-4 uh, calcium imaging. We add, um, we add the, the KCL, and then uh, in, in real in real time, we can just monitor the change in, in fluorescence. So we can actually uh, monitor the response uh, by calcium imaging. So uh, our story is actually built on an observation that was originally uh, discovered in the lab of David Greenberg in, in Harvard, and where they, they found that uh, th this is the, the basically the, the cell culture that we're using. These are primary cortical neurons, and they found that when they depolarize neurons, they, uh, so they, again using KCL, we use exactly the same conditions, they get this rearrangement of a particular chromatin protein. So this is MECP2. Um, this is actually the, the protein that is uh, mutated in Rett syndrome. Um, and what they found is that from this diffuse localization in control cells, in the hyperstimulated neurons, it starts to localize in heterochromatin regions. So you can see these heterochromatin regions by staining the DNA. The blue is the DNA. And then in the merge, you can see that they co-localize perfectly. Where here, you can see that the pink is mostly within, in between these condensed chromatin regions. Um, and again, they also characterize the neurons to show that they, they are actually expressing the right markers. So the first thing that we wanted to do is see whether we can re recapitulate this in our system. So we repeated these experiments. And indeed, you can again see here the, the almost diffuse localization. Every now and then, you do see some foci. I'm, I'm guessing this is because of spontaneous uh, uh, firing of the neuronal cultures. But you do see a, a diffuse localization of this protein without KCL. And then a uh, few minutes and uh, hours later, you can see the uh, condensation of this protein, if you will, in these heterochromatin foci. So the assay worked. And then we wanted to see whether this is particular, uh, particularly true only for this protein, but, or, or is it a more general phenomena that occurs with, with chromatin in these excited neurons. So we looked at other markers, such as heterochromatin protein uh, 1, Gamma, HP1, is one of those proteins that I showed you earlier that binds heterochromatin dynamically. And actually, from other studies, we knew that it's a, a relatively diffuse in a, a nuclei of cultured neurons and in other cell types. And indeed, uh, within an hour or so, you can see that HP1 gamma starts to accumulate in these hyperexcited neurons. Um, so finally, we also looked at the histone, uh, the modified histone themselves. So this particular histone modification, methylated lysinine, is a histone modification that is very tightly associated with heterochromatin. So if you, if you now uh, try to, to uh, look at where histones are modified in, in which way, you will see that, and, and again, you can see it quite uh, clearly, that A3K9 methylation is almost completely superimposed on these dappy dense or heterochromatic regions, the, the suppressed and condensed chromatin. Whereas other modifications, such as lysine 4 methylation or lysine 9 acetylation, would be exactly the reverse or, or the mirror image, and you would see it enriched in all the open. Uh, chromatin regions. Uh, so, so we now know a relatively a good deal about this histone code, which modification of the histone is associated with active or inactive chromatin. So since we're looking at reorganization of condensed chromatin, we're, we uh, focused on K9 methylation. And what we found was, again, uh, to, to a much less extent than what we saw earlier, because this is already very heterochromatic, we could still see a lot of this modification in between 
this condensed chromatin or in, in open chromatin regions, whereas in the hyperstimulated neurons, it was by and large uh, confined to the uh, heterochromatin itself. It wasn't true for all proteins. Another uh, protein that uh, showed no organization, this is just one control, uh, was HP1 alpha. It's another heterochromatin protein. There are actually three, alpha, beta, and gamma. So I showed you earlier that gamma uh, redistributes into this heterochromatin foci. By alpha already starts at these heterochromatin foci, and we could fi find no differences between unstimulated and stimulated uh, uh, neurons. So it's not, uh, it's not true for all proteins, and it's, it's probably just uh, a matter of, of a regulated process of some, uh, uh, some mechanism or, or some biological uh, pathway. Can I ask a quick question? Yes, yes, of course. Please stop me whenever. I, I With a pheasant chloride stimulation, you yeah. see those... Uh, uh, H3, yeah. you know, they, they are condensed a yes. lot more to the heterochromatin. Yes. The meaning of that is, are they ensuring that heterochromatin is not, even more tightly controlled not to express? No. So I think actually it's the other way around. So what what we think is happening, and I'll, I'll, I'll now go back to it, is that by re... This is a suppressor, and this is a suppressor. So, so they are suppressing expression in these non-stimulated neurons. And when they are reorganized, they are actually relieving the suppression of the, of the open. Exactly. They're liberating the non-condensed chromatin. This is the, the idea that we so believe. if you RNA-seq, uh, that two stages, you should see some of the stress. Right. So, so yes. We, we'll get there. Um, and... Uh, uh, so, so the next thing we wanted to do actually is a look at the dynamics of, of chromatin proteins. We used H1, uh, this linker histone, as, as a surrogate for chromatin uh, plasticity. Um, and these, this is how the neurons look like when they express. So these are living neurons expressing H1 GFP fusion protein. So you can see that H1 uh, is, uh, is nuclear, of course and it resides both in, in heterochromatin regions and also in euchromatin. So you can actually uh, measure the dynamics in both these regions separately, which the is... GFP, the, the tagging does not interfere with the... Yeah, th this is, a, of course, a, a major question in the field. And uh, so, so whenever we generate a new protein, a fusion protein that has not been characterized previously, we have to ensure that it's functional. In this case, uh, all the, all the core and linker histones has been thoroughly characterized. And in fact, mice were generated with this and they're fertile and viable with the GFP. And it's, it's, it's surprising because the GFP is bigger than the original yeah, histone. This is what I, ask you. I know. So, so you have to test where you can stick in your GFP without affecting the protein. It's not, it, it's not always the case. We actually have a library now of about 200 uh, fusion proteins, and we estimate that only about 50% of them, or, or a little bit less, are functional. So maybe 40%. But for, for but chromatin... Affect the kinetics probably, no? So this, uh, it actually, um, we know how it affects the kinetics. You can put it in the model. So the, the size of the protein affects the kinetics. So if you add one GFP, two GFP, or three GFPs, you can do a, a kinetic modeling of how the GFP affects your... your um, so we know that. It does affect, but to a small extent. Because the diffusion coefficient of GFP is extremely high, and if you just take GFP with, without anything, the graphs are, are essentially almost reaching saturation immediately. So, but we can insert it into the... Uh, into our model. So, for example, I don't show it, but if you would do the same frap with a, with a G, uh, naked GFP, it would look like this. It's, it's extremely highly dynamic. Um, so this is what it looks like. These are the resting neurons, the NACL, and then when you hyperpolarize neuron, and actually it happens pretty fast, within minutes, you can see suddenly a uh, a more open chromatin, if you will, hyperdynamic uh, plasticity of, of H1, of linker histones. Um, th this was true, actually, quite surprisingly, both for uh, post-mitotic neurons and also for 
uh, cells that have not completely matured but already express some potassium channels. Yeah. So I think the question, we should ask you the, the same question the other way around. Can the uh, GFT actually increase the solubility and alter not only hinder it and change it, but cause it to be, let's say, if it's more uh, um, hydrophilic or something, it can actually increase the dynamics and, and do not represent it to the other way, actually due to its right. So, yeah, the, so, so this is a whole field. I mean, th this is really, uh, I mean, people have been discussing this for, for about uh, 15 years in the literature. Um, and, and there are models to try to explain it. But, but even if it does change the dynamics, we are, of course, using the same construct here and here. So yeah. let's assume that we're not measuring the real dynamics. There is still a change. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so when you do the, exactly the same experiment with and without KCL, and of course we're using just to control for molar uh, salinity, uh, we're using NACL, so, so we, see, we see a difference. So if, e even if we're not measuring the exact dynamics of H1, we do know that it changes following neuronal excitation. But, but thank you for clarifying. Um, so we, we were wondering what could regulate H1 uh, dynamics, and this is a, a cutting a, f a couple of years of, of guesswork. Uh, we ended up by focusing on this protein right here, PARP1. And, and the reason is, and again, without, without going into too much detail, um, PARP1, first of all, is the enzyme that mediates one of the modifications, histone modifications and, and protein modifications in general, a modification which is called poly-ADP ribosylation, or PAR, or parylation. And parylation is actually involved, PARP1 itself is involved in many cellular processes, and it has several substrates. Uh, you can see uh, PARP1 involved in DNA repair and, and DNA methylation, uh, histone structure and chromatin structure, and even inflammation. But one of the interesting things is that uh, H1 was shown to be one of the major uh, PARP1 targets. So uh, H1 is heavily polyribosylated by PARP1. And also it was shown by, by uh, Malka Cohen Amon from Sheba um, when she was uh, uh, in a sabbatical with Eric Kandel um, that basically this process, uh, H1 parylation, is, is involved in long-term memory. This, was, this work was done in aplysia, and we thought we were entertaining the idea that maybe what we see in, in our cultured mammalian neurons might actually be more or less the same. This is calcium-dependent, this part, right? um, Yeah, so, yeah, neural, yes, yes, it's calcium-dependent. Um, okay, so, the first thing we wanted to do is whether we actually do see an increase in parylation in poly-ADP ribosylation in, in our cultured neurons, and indeed this, this was the case. So it's hard to see here, but this is quantified. So if you, if you now hyperpolarize your, your neurons, you do see this increase in parylation, in, in global level of parylation. Uh, and when you, when you inhibit PARP1, you, again, not surprisingly, but just to see that it works in our system. So we use two different PARP1 inhibitors, 3RB and DHIQ. We can prevent, uh, by and large, I think, yeah, we can prevent this uh, uh, parylation. We also tested this biochemically, uh, and, and we show that uh, if you do an, a co-IP of PARP1 and PAR, you can see that the KCL increases, and when you add the... Uh, PARP1 inhibitor, you prevent uh, all of this uh, parylation increase. So what happens to the uh, chromatin dynamics? Uh, if you add PARP1 inhibitors, and, and actually we did, we did all these experiments with at least two or three different PARP1 inhibitors, we were able to prevent uh, uh, the majority of this uh, response. Not always everything, I, I should um, I should stress this point because we don't believe that we actually found <coughs> the only mechanism that supports this chromatin dynamics, but at least uh, at least one of the mechanisms. Um, 
So if, and this is quite fundamental because if you now have your cultured neurons, you add, uh, uh, you, you stimulate, you hyperstimulate, they start to express what we call immediately er, immediate early genes. And we, we see that by RNA sequencing and, and microarrays, and I'll show you some examples. Uh, but if you add PARP1 inhibitors without parilation, you prevent this immediate, er, uh, immediate early gene response. Um, and this is again the same experiment with different uh, uh, PARP1 inhibitors. Uh, again, the same experiment. These are in, in NSCs, so the, it's a little bit less pronounced. And we also uh, ver verify this biochemically. So again, NACL, KCL, now we're looking at H1 release from chromatin. So this is, if you will, the biochemical equivalent of the FRAP experiments. We're now looking how uh, the association between chromatin and H1 using bi biochemistry instead of uh, cell biology. So it's released much faster in the KCL, just like we see by, by FRAP experiments. And again, this is prevented by uh, PARP1 inhibitors. So uh, molecularly, as, as it was pointed out, we have a calcium flux um, that uh, uh, causes uh, calcium calmodulin proteins uh, to be phosphorylated, which now enter the nucleus and, and can drive the expression of immediate early genes, such as CFOS, BDNF, uh, or BDNF receptors. And other, these are, are just examples. We actually have, have generated uh, RNA sequencing and microarrays here just to, so, so we have a list of genes, but so uh, I'm not going to go into this list. It's, it's not uh, revealing any more than just taking a few examples and looking how these behave. So how do these behave? Th these are top three candidates. So indeed, if you, uh, if you hyperstimulate your neurons with KCL, you get a, a, a rapid and significant increase in, in immediate early gene expression. And, and these are these several examples. Now, if you do the same experiment in the presence of PARP inhibitor, you, you prevent it maybe to various degrees, but you, you almost uh, prevent all this uh, immediate early gene expression response. And, and, and th this is a, a, an important experiment. What we are now looking at is the association of H1 with the promoters of these, of these genes. So we're doing chromatin IP. We're looking at the binding, the direct binding of H1 to CFOS, to CJUN, to EGR. And, and we see that when we add KCL, just like we saw earlier with the FRAP experiments and the biochemical experiments, there is a release of H1. It's a, like a release of the suppression from these genes. So H1 is released, and if we add the PARP inhibitor, we prevent this release. So, so it's really suggesting mechanistically that this H1 release from, from these genes is, is, doing, uh, is doing this action and, and by uh, poly-ADP ribosylation. And in fact, when we now looked at uh, PARP1 on the promoters of these genes, we see the exact mirror image. So it looks like H1 and PARP1 are actually competing. This was not actually our idea. So uh, it was shown for another system that there might be a competition with, the, with PARP1 and H1. Hence, we looked at it. And whenever H1 frees the, the promoter, PARP1 uh, uh, takes its place. So you can see almost a mirror image of these three. This is always controls. So there's a competition between PARP1 and H1 when PARP1 uh, when H1 is released, PARP1 takes its place. And this competition or this reciprocal binding is inhibited by PARP1 inhibitors. So PARP1 has to be active in order uh, for this to occur. Uh, so this is the mo model that we're entertaining that uh, in uh, resting, uh, in, in uh, the transition from resting neurons to, to hyper-stimulated uh, neurons, we have a um, uh, PARP1 parilation of histone H1, which causes histone H1 release 
from the promoters of uh, immediate early genes and uh, their subsequent transcription. PARP1 inhibitors, of course, will prevent this mechanism. So what I've shown you is that neuronal excitation leads to H1 hyperdynamics, that this uh, H1 dynamics is at least partly mediated by PARP1. And again, uh, for some of the experiments, we have not seen 100% uh, decrease, and therefore we're, we're, we're always cautious. Um, depolarization leads to PARP1-assisted immediate early gene expression, and, and H1 and PARP1 actually show this reciprocal binding of immediate early gene promoters. Um, so, do I have a few minutes or? Maybe we have a question about this and then we... Okay, I mean, I can also end. I mean, I don't have to, but it's... Yeah, sure. Okay. I mean, okay, we see that there is dynamics here, yeah. but what is this good for? Is it for development or for function when they are mature? Um, so, the, these neurons are actually... So, so, most of the experiments that we've done, and we only just started uh, more recently with the with the stem cells, are post-mitotic, are fully mature, functional neuron. Yeah. So we believe that this is something fundamental, fundamentally important for the uh, mature brain. Yes. But this is a housekeeping, or this is for transmitter of this, or for so, what? So these genes actually, th these are transcription factors. These, these genes are activated uh, in all stimulated neurons. Um, in vivo, following, you can see so many different paradigms where, where these genes are, are activated. So uh, starting from uh, 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 psychological stress to uh, um, uh, inserting an electrode inside the brain and, and stimulating a region. So uh, everything from, from very general to, to very specific, these genes are always turned on for some reason. So, so there is a basic mechanism, in, and this is exactly what uh, Greenberg and other, others were covering in this uh, now quite old, 12, 13 years old uh, review in Nature Review Neuroscience, is the fundamental properties of a neuronal excitation that at the molecular level, it's very conserved. You always have this calcium influx, phosphorylation of calcium calmodulin, entry into the nucleus and this immediate early gene. Now it's not always the same genes. The, these are, uh, could be two, two, three hundred genes. But some of, some of them, for some reason, CFOS you always find. Um, so it's a transcription factor, it has targets. Um, and s sometimes you have a different um, subset of genes, a different areas of the brain, different paradigms and, and so on. But, but there is a conserved mechanism molecular mechanisms of, of this transition from uh, the hyper-excited state to gene expression. Okay? <laughs> uh, so, I, I, don't, I mean, again, if, if I can stop here or I can, uh, yeah, can tell you. Huh? Okay, so, so this is, a, uh, this is a, again, something even, this is the craziest thing that, that we've ever done, and, and it really started with this student. I have to say, uh, David was a, a very talented student that uh, performed his master's with me, and during his one or one year uh, in the lab, he already published an NSMB paper, and he, he was really into, into evolution, molecular evolution, and I couldn't help him with that. So I told him, okay, go to Liran Carmel's lab, and we'll find something to do together. So, we, we went to this lab retreat, and, the, and he was into Neanderthals, and I knew nothing about ancient genomes. But I, you know, we started talking over coffee, and I said, you know, David, why do, don't we do epigenetics of Neanderthals? So he started thinking about this, and, and we came up with an idea. It's, a, it's actually now under revision, so we're very hopeful that it's going to come out soon. An idea to reconstruct. Uh, methylation maps of archaic genomes. So, so this is a, th that's the idea. First of all, if you look at the primary sequence of, of Neanderthals or, or ancient genomes, so, so some people find like these candidate genes that might explain phenotype, but overall there's very little difference. Uh, and these differences, so 78 differences were found in the first low resolution sequence and, and the 
one that came out three months ago, there are about 200 differences, but they, they cannot really explain a, a lot of the differences between. So, so we believe that there is an epigenetic component that is really important between us and, and the uh, ancient genomes, and, and proteins between humans and chimps are more than 99% identical. DNA is around 98.8. So we're essentially the same. So how can it be? And the question, of course, is, is epigenetic. And, and we were wondering, can we say anything about gene regulation of archaic genomes? Um, so this is the, the fundamental principle of epigenetics. DNA can be methylated. Okay, So this was Chaim Seders and other people's work, which I hope will, will uh, uh, pan out at some, some point. But the, the idea is that DNA, of course, you know, is only, only contains four, four letters, A, G, T, C, but the C can be methylated. And this methylation can change gene expression. If the promoter is hypermethylated, the gene is off. It's, if it's not, the gene is on, and so on. And how do we, how do we know if, if the DNA is methylated or not? We use what we call bisulfite sequencing. It's a very simple chemical uh, reaction. You add this component bisulfite, and what it does, it, it, it's, it's a very basic uh, uh, solution, so you get basically deamination of your cytosine. If the cytosine is methylated, the deamination does nothing to your cytosine, and it remains cytosine. If it's not deaminated, it will turn into a uridine. Okay, so that's what deamination does. We figured out that instead of adding bisulfite, you can take a DNA and put it 50,000 years under the ground. It will do the same. So actually, ancient genomes do this process uh, uh, naturally. So there is a natural uh, uh, deamination process. And, and uh, so this is what happens to, uh, to ancient genomes. Methylated C actually gets uh, uh, to T. De demethylated C turns into a U. Now, during the process of sequencing, there is trimming of uracils for technical reasons, which we'll not go into. But what, what we're left with is either methylated or unmethylated in the pre-mortem DNA. The deamination takes place, so the Cs will turn into Us. Uh, Us. The, the Cs, some of them will turn into Ts, and then we'll have uracil trimming. So we can actually calculate the C to T ratio and, and get a global maps of DNA methylation, reconstructed. And when we did this, we found an amazing correlation. So this uh, uh, on the x-axis is the percent of, of methylation in modern osteoblasts, modern human, this is measured rates of methylation, okay? Has nothing to do with sequence. And this is our calcula calculated C to T ratio. So you see the correlation is almost, uh, uh, is almost ideal. So I, I, this method works, and now we can zoom in uh, on, on regions. So by and large, we see a very nice correlation. Uh, we have a, th this is our reconstructed methylation maps, and this is the present day methylation. And the, the, the problem is that today, there's only a relatively little coverage of the methylation maps in humans. And, and therefore, you see only a, a sparse uh, region. But nonetheless, we can zoom in on, on genes and regions. And we can show that there is a very good correlation. This is hypermethylated. This is non-methylated. And then, of course, the interesting thing is differentially methylated regions. What are the genes that are different between us? And to cut a long story short, we, we found very prominent genes. Hox D9, Hox D10. There is no difference in the actual sequence. The proteins are identical. And Hox D9 and Hox D10, it, mutations in these genes, they actually look like Neanderthal mutations. If you look at the mouse, it has the hip of a Neanderthal. So it, it, we were very pleasantly surprised from these uh, examples. And, and um, just to make sure that we're not uh, looking at an individual uh, we, we constructed, uh, uh, we reconstructed samples, 25 samples uh, ranging from different ages and, and different genders and etc. Um, so 
Yeah, so I don't want to steal too much time. We, we came up with a list of about 1,000 differentially methylated regions, which is five times higher than the number of differentially uh, expressed protein or, or uh, in terms of sequence. And, uh, and this is the, the punchline. What are the functions of, the, of these genes that are associated with these changes in DMRs? Uh, you can see no, so, so this is a, a, a change uh, heat map. Our digestive system, we believe, is almost identical, no changes. Here you can see limbs, of course, we know are changing, and the brain is the most important area. And if you focus in on the brain, you can see which regions are different in terms of the, the epigenetics between us. The, the most significant is the prefrontal cortex, the amygdala, uh, the hypothalamus, um, but, but really the prefrontal cortex is the most significant area in our body that is epigenetically different between us and Neanderthals. There's also a story about diseases, but uh, that's it. So, so this, is, this is the video. It's really is it a, terribly similar? Um, I mean, they, these are so, like monkeys. So yeah, so, so the, you see that, the, wait, here I, I should. Um, this is now, a, a, so if you look at the brain in the whole body, the, the cerebellum is red. But now we, we redid it just to, to emphasize which parts of the brain, so everything is different. But the cerebellar is much less different than the prefrontal cortex. Okay, yeah. So, so th this, is, this is it.